Okay, so let's get started. Um, first, uh, there are not so many people there, but I wanted to ask uh, uh, one question is this, this class, course rather, formally ends on November 20th, uh, which is not so long, not so far in the future. So I think we'll have to uh, start focusing on the final project and we'll make the next homework your plans for final plans for that. This is almost um well, it's at least three weeks or three or four weeks less than normal. Um, maybe four weeks less than normal. But there may be some people who need to have a class in that um, for immigration reasons in that uh, three week period after Thanksgiving. If you do, just drop me a note. Otherwise, I'm assuming November twentieth is the last uh, class in this course. <clears throat> so are there any questions on anything? Well, no questions, it appears. Okay. Let's, uh, well, now I'll now share my screen. I assume you can share, see my screen, is that correct? Well, there are two chats. Let me see what the chats are. So, uh, Final project for undergraduate, do you want a formal report or a or brief research? Well, we would like some brief research accompanied by a report. I'm not certain what an informal report is, but uh, reports can be at different lengths, but they all should be written in a professional fashion. And yeah, is that, was that clear or do you need further clarification? All right, so now I'll get started. Oh, well then now. I should say if you need to get a, an extension to finish your project, that's fine. We'll still be here. Um, because we can, although as Gregor says, it's your responsibility, we can certainly, if you drop us a note, we'll try to, if we have an idea, we'll send it to you. But uh, finding data is a, possibly the hardest part of this whole area in academia, because whereas industry is deluged with data, academia only gets a small part of it. So there are many good projects which you can't do because, especially in the health area, which we're covering now, which you can't do because you can't get the data or you can't get enough data to be interesting. Namely, uh, I give, always give the example of Fitbits you can get permission to accumulate the data from a hundred local people with their, with their smart watches, but it's sort of rather uh, ridiculous given the Fitbit has, I don't know, tens of millions of such data, data sets. All right, so uh, we were just going through this summary of, of health and medicine. And the next the slide, which I stopped before, was this one here. 
which notes that um, if we look at this juggernaut, which I call the AI cloud internet juggernaut, it's not always moving with inexorable speed. Um, an area that um, was not so fast as I, I think some people might have expected this consumer robotics. And then reading these notes, I see that, uh, that they sort of highlight many of my failures. Namely, it points out virtual reality was quite slow. Well, I was working on virtual reality in the early 1990s and or maybe late 1990s, that's 1990s, 1905 or something. And that was touted to be an incredible revolution. We were working with a startup that was developing new headsets, but it was too early. It didn't work out in those days and it's still not working out. And there is an area which uh, I, in the secure, in blockchain, which is a very well publicized area, and it is not seeming to make quite as much impact as people thought. And there was a prediction from this company, Business Intelligence, that it would be revolutionary. And in their defense, they say they made a correct prediction that telemedicine wouldn't take off. But actually, the following year, this year, telemedicine is a totally dominant trend. So they even got that wrong. Well, here's a, a comment on a class of um, areas which I would say is reasonably mature, namely, uh, there's a whole set of applications which analyzes text. And those are reasonably easy to understand in that analyzing text is possibly the best developed part of deep learning. And um, I remember even at the beginning of this, uh, but this was even not deep learning, that um, if you wanted to find out about earthquakes, you got better, better information about earthquakes from Twitter than you did from the US Geological Survey. Uh, because that ge ge geological survey went through a process where tweets just went out immediately. And for something like a tsunami or an earthquake, that's pretty, th those are pretty reliable tweets. Um, there's a note here that even the, uh, COVID epidemic was discovered earlier by um, by scanning Wuhan data than, than it was by some formal mechanism. There is a famous example of Google flu trends, which was very popular in, in well, I guess seven or eight years ago, but it got canceled because it messed up. Although I still think it was, it's probably basically correct. They just oversold it and then got embarrassed and withdrew it, but it probably should have been kept on. Um, there's a related topic, which is, there's lots of work on, including at Indiana University, which is to um, do automatic uh, text analysis of papers. When I mean, there are so many papers these days and in a broad interdisciplinary area like COVID, it is impossible to keep track of individual papers. And, for some of these areas is reasonably easy to with a uh, computer analysis to, to, to find out the uh, tags which will signify papers of interest. Well, of course, for COVID, you can look for COVID. But then say chemistry, chemistry, chemical, chemistry has obvious symbols which you can scan for. And so you can do pretty precise and the same as in biology, lots of straight, uh, well-known text strings and symbols to scan for. And so in biomedicine and chemistry, you can do rather good jobs with automatic scanning of literature to find out if there's, for instance, papers giving some, some issues on, uh, on uh, a disease you're interested in. All right, and I see there are Six chat messages. Are there any of those I should worry about? It doesn't look so. Okay. We can do those at the end. 
Somebody use their audio if you need me to, uh, to, to interact now. Um, well, I already mentioned um, <coughs> um, <coughs> um, the internet and medical things, which is, I would say is actually starting to take off this year. Previous years, it wasn't so, so prevalent, but nowadays uh, with the uh, rapid progress in the smartwatches and other types of um, health, um, health wearables, it is really making a lot of progress and that's, that progress has been enhanced again by COVID because COVID has enhanced the general area of telemedicine. And obviously IoT gives you small devices that the patient in a remote area can wear and now the signals from those devices can be sent back to the doctors or just sent back to the cloud and reviewed by doctors. And we have, we have several examples of these. And um, this data can be used to be um, not just quite so reactive, more preventive. And then you can monitor the patient in an automatic fashion and identify trends. And um, there are other examples we'll see of the of helping uh, administrative tasks by uh, things like doing automatic uh, um, audio to text and things like that. And we actually, I think we saw an example of a robot nurse uh, taking blood. And uh, this was, um, so these, these are suggesting uh, values of the internet and medical things of up to uh, between 45 and $66 billion in 2022. And um, it's not surprising, it has some various features, which are what you'd expect, the basic hardware of the device. And that's probably a, more, a larger component uh, for medical internet and medical things than it is for other solutions. The other solutions would have to be pure software. You have to have the network to connect the device to the cloud. You will need some software either running on the cloud or the, um, or the wearable. And uh, you may need remote um, invocation and obviously security is relevant. Well, here is, uh, I mentioned that uh, the, if you do it yourself, it's, not, it's typically not easy to get Fitbit data, but uh, Scripps, which is a very prestigious institution in California, uh, were able to get data from Fitbit for 200,000 users. And they were able to show that that data um, was able to uh, predict flu outbreaks from the changes in the, in the monitor signals and the sleep patterns. And um, we look at the number of people who are actually um, using wearables, it is still not, I mean, giant is 25, what is it here? The claim is 23% a day slowly growing. Um, that number ought to be bigger. And um, Fitbit, I mean, I have a Fitbit Ionic, which is before the sense and they keep Fitbit, I, I don't like Fitbit, one, at least one aspect, they keep sending you emails trying to get you to buy a new device even though you only just got their old device. Um, anyway, they have, uh, they, they, they are now adding correctly new capabilities to their system. And um, I guess this is, um, uh, well, this is so-called electrodermal. Well, dermal must be skin. So it must be measuring the electrical activity inside your skin. And that allows you to decide, well, I think I know when I'm stressed, I'm always stressed. And um, possibly even more importantly as well, that Fitbit essentially make a smartwatch, but um, Apple is making huge progress. I have another slide on Apple. And there's this interesting, um, it's got a nice name, New Tigers, which comes from Princeton University, who uh, has, a, seems to have developed several ideas in this area. This whole area is a in my opinion, very, very interesting to know what you can do and with what time scale. And they point out it's actually relatively hard to, to span the difference between what's needed to make it medically sound, absolutely robust. That's a rather expensive sensor 
Whereas what you can afford to put in a consumer device, which has to be cheap. So um, Apple just added the, uh, this uh, blood oxygen detection feature and um, they put it in their um, Apple Watch Series 6. So, and over here we have Amazon, which has just introduced its uh, wearable called Halo, which is meant to measure the same type of thing, body fat percentage, sleep temperature, and it will, it seems, measure your tone of voice and see whether, see whether you're angry or not. Well, I think I know when I'm angry or not, but maybe it's useful to have a have the computer telling me I'm getting angry. So here's some more example. Here's a smart diaper, very useful wearable. And here's more or more somewhat higher end disease at least, namely diabetes management, blood glucose monitors. Those must have obvious relevance. I'm fortunate, I, I don't have diabetes, but it's clear if you do that having monitors for that would be very helpful. Um, a lot of these, of course, are all built around your phone. They're devices that communicate by Bluetooth and things like that with your phone. Here's an even more important thing, namely your um, electric toothbrush, just what you wanted. Uh, this toothbrush is uh, fully integrated with uh, Alexa, so it can tell you how well you're brushing. And uh, when it's not telling you that to brush better, it will play you music or whatever you want to hear. Or maybe it can even play you the video from this course. So this is just, so this is um, at least, I don't know how, I, but I mean, in principle, if, uh, if the toothbrush could actually really tell you when you're not brushing in a, most professional fashion and um, it is possibly a pretty important device because taking good care of your teeth is a good idea. All right. And of course, these people are deciding whether it's going to take away the market for smart speakers, but uh, it appears that only 13% of people today have a smart speaker in their, in their bathroom and this will allow them to have a smart speaker in their bathroom. All right, here is another more serious uh, one, a digital. I should point out these slides are just all instances. This, this is a field where there are lots and lots and lots of examples. And most of the startups are, are a single example. That's actually a worthy lesson. You shouldn't try to bite off too much. If you just have one good idea and implement it well, that's the key to success. And um, <clears throat> this is obviously relevant for telemedicine, a digital telescope, which a stethoscope, which um, can be, used, be accessed by a telemedicine by the physician to interpret the results. Um, all right. Here are a few slides. There are rather more of them in this topic of just documenting that COVID did a bit of damage. Um, but this is not necessarily damage, it's shift. It um, just points out the obvious that uh, COVID has increased the amount of online purchases. It went from 11.5% uh, in Q1 2020 to 15.1% of commerce in Q2, second quarter, uh, April through, uh, through June. Um, and this is meant, to, and here are some projections about what it's saying. It's still only, well, in 2024, it's still only 18%. E-commerce is meant to 18% of the uh, of the sales in the US. But if you go to the plot on the right, that's sort of interesting that um, in 2024, the 18% of the US contrasts with 59% in China. So China is way ahead on the electronic commerce field. Um, 
And there's a plot in the middle, which is sort of a, a, a little part of this, namely which part of that electronic commerce comes through Facebook and WeChat and things like that, Instagram. And that's the so-called social commerce sales. And that's not, you just look at these numbers, they're relatively small compared to the total uh, because they're um, 45 billion uh, for the year in 2023. And we are up here for um, uh, <clears throat> for the total for the year at almost a trillion. So this is modest, but China is ten times bigger than the U.S. in using um, smart media, so social media to spur e-commerce. And we have a sort of obviously accelerated by COVID. Here is a slightly sad, this is a, a trend for Uber, pointing out the obvious that Uber rides went down 75% um, due, to the, due to COVID. However, the uh, Uber Eats, uh, part of Uber went up almost a factor of two. And in fact, in, in this uh, Q2 2020, Uber Eats was, significant, was twice the size of Uber rides which is slightly surprising. Here is a sad one. Obviously, the aircraft industry has been, been hugely impacted by COVID, and it's not obviously re uh, recovering. There's all sorts of discussion these days about uh, helping the airlines more. I mean, we certainly need to, it's, uh, they have a clear case, but um, here we see these giant, um, well here, these numbers, this one here is probably the best, uh, shows the uh, operating revenue of the major US airlines and it's basically down a factor of, um, almost a factor of five, somewhere between five and 10. Um, Delta seems to be the worst with 88% decrease from Q2 2019 to Q2 2020. And the same, I mean, not only, of course, are airlines are doing badly, but so are, so are airports. So here's airport revenue down, um, down uh, up to 60%. And here's a lot of sad aircraft park doing nothing. Um, there are lots of stories online about air, 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 aircraft being, um, being retired early because obviously, the, 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 they won't need as many aircraft in the future, so they're taking the up, they're doing what they have to do, which is to take the least efficient or the least well matched to the passenger traffic, like the one, the really impressive uh, Airbus 380, which is this giant airline. Air, airline is effectively being retired by many. That, that airplane is being replied by many airlines because they just don't have need for giant aircraft these days. And a lot of those are sitting quite relatively modern aircraft are sitting in scrapyards. Uh, even worse is cruise lines, because cruise lines have a, were actually were the, uh, one of the earliest impacts of COVID was on cruise lines. And you can see these uh, drastic reductions in, uh, in revenue. 19, remember airlines were just 88%. Well, here we have 99% for Norwegian cruise lines. And um, for some reason, Carnival is doing better at 85%. And, um, and the claim is that this impact in the air area will be largest for international travel. Here's some numbers. Uh, here's a, some survey which was asking people what, what will happen. Domestic travel, there was um, not much difference between reduce and increase due to COVID, I mean, after COVID, but everybody agreed they would reduce international travel. Um, yeah, Non-trivial numbers said they wouldn't go to the mall as much. Um, but you can see any country or, or organization relying on international tourism that has drastically decreased across the whole world. But actually the Americas decreasing the least. Uh, well, we've seen this. We, 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 now it's part of that e-commerce, 
there's a special feature of, of groceries and groceries were struggling to, to actually make much progress with uh, e-grocery, but um, the, the COVID has made e has really jump-started e-groceries to make it a non-trivial um, uh, component. And I think, for instance, myself, I'm sure my family will make, continue to make uh, more use of e-groceries than we did in the past. Here is a um, slightly surprising number to me in that we know restaurants were impacted, but at least in the September 23rd um, news item I found from some company, they claimed that it's only down 10% at the moment. And that was, um, whereas it was down, here are some numbers from April, in April it was down drastic amounts. So that's sort of slightly surprising that it was is still, that it's recovered so well. And here is one I just saw today, I added this this morning, namely it claims that uh, more than half of Indiana hotels may close, that will have a actually non-trivial impact because uh, certainly hotels get used to get full when you went at least the, the ones in Bloomington are full of various events and the number of, when you go to, at least when I would used to go to the airport, sometimes those hotels got pretty full. Anyway, this is claiming it might be um, up to a half. It probably won't be a half, but uh, it, will, it points out that uh, travel is still struggling. All right, so that's that. Uh, the next section is on um, how we tackle the problem. So these are mechanisms. So I've been through a lot of health and medicine examples. So these are examples which are focused on COVID. Um, well, here's some <clears throat> little uh, news item I found, which said, if we wanted to try to prevent COVID in the future, it would cost 2% of the, over the next 10 years of the economic impact of COVID. It's not a trivial number, $260 billion to prevent pandemics but that is meant to be 2% of the $11 trillion bill that uh, COVID has presented to the, to the various governments. <coughs> All right. I am sure we will not spend $260 billion. Um, well, here's a, now here again, these are still nuggets. Uh, this nugget points out that um, obviously there's more online um, activity and online activity uh, has to be supported. And one aspect of that support, which ought to be better than it is, are chatbots. We know that the technology for interpreting audio is dramatically improved. I don't personally think that chatbots have dramatically improved in helpfulness because I didn't think they were very helpful originally and they're still not so helpful to me, but uh, we'll see. Anyway, it appears that um, many, uh, many industries are going to improve, increase the use of chatbots. And I'm sure for some things that can be helpful. Here we have a little comment on what we're doing now about remote work and remote classes and things. And um, at least mm, some of us are probably in the software and IT industry. And this survey claims that that is the industry where remote working is highly effective. And um, over 80% of the people surveyed thought the entire industry could be affected with remote work. Whereas in travel, it's down at 37% and retail miles on things 29%. Well, we, uh, we're using Zoom, of course. And this is, I, I mentioned to you that uh, this, this, this slide deck remind me of my failures. I told you I failed to develop a virtual reality engine in the mid nineties. I also failed to develop a video conferencing platform in 2001. We had a really good startup then, this was a time of lots of startups and we was very competitive with WebEx and things like that. That was, WebEx was one of our competitors at the time. Uh, we couldn't, unfortunately we got caught up with the um, 
with the crash around 2000, which took a lot of uh, startups down with it, and we lost uh, the key funding necessary to continue. But our main problem in those days, which was probably still was certainly true for WebEx and things, was the poor quality of the internet. The internet was so unreliable that you often lost uh, linkage between the various clients. I mean, we were building collaborative technology, uh, which linked various things, to, uh, were linked uh, apps on the apps on the day in the data center to people on the to, to people uh, remotely, including actually for e education. We did lots of e education in those days, um, remote uh, remote classes, but. We weren't a failure, but we were our most our effort, which is where we couldn't get the additional funding to to solve, was largely dominated by the internet. But now the internet is much better, and we have a, quite a few players: uh, Microsoft Teams, Blue Jeans, Zoom, Google Meet, and WebEx. The top five across the top there. I use continue. I mean, I use many people. I many organizations I know use these uh, systems. Although Zoom is the most popular, Zoom seems to have particular um, huge impact, huge inroads into research organizations and universities, because most of those all seem to use Zoom. Um, I even gave a talk yesterday to a conference in Turkey, which was not obviously going to have quite the same, um, same choices as here and that conference, virtual conference was using Zoom. All right, so, <clears throat> and um, so there are some uh, surveys here about, um, about this field and, um, uh, and we, there's no, there's little doubt that this field will, will, will increase. I mean, there will not only the pure conferencing, which we're doing now, but also I, I, I at the moment, I'm submitting papers to a couple of conferences, and they are using custom applications to support the remote delivery of the uh, of the uh, of the papers. And they're not in the they're not the remote delivery, which is asynchronous, are not any of these companies. There are additional companies. <coughs> so the the uh, movement of conferences to be online has created little industry supporting them. Um, so this is uh, just a few more of these uh, um, charts, uh, points that Microsoft Teams has had a dramatic increase in use. Um, there is the well-known problem with Zoom, which I have not noticed. Guess my my talks are not interesting enough for people to try to invade them, uh, but uh, we know that several, especially Tesla, is is well known to have abolished Zoom inside their company. But there are other companies. And Cisco, I'm a bit surprised Cisco hasn't abolished Zoom because Cisco owns Webex, and I would assume that Zoom is Webex's main competitor. I mean, Webex used to be the standard in this field. And Zoom was actually set up by uh, um, WebEx staff who left WebEx to, to try to do it differently in Zoom. All right. And of course, Microsoft is here using Zoom. And again, they have Teams. So you would expect Google with Google Meet and Hangout, um, Microsoft and Cisco not to want to use Zoom. But the actually the company that's most negative is Tesla. And there's sort of an interesting chart up here, which points out that Zoom and Google have a much higher personal use um, than, than the other systems. Blue Jeans has a small amount of personal use. And maybe that's not so surprising, at least for the personal use I see. Uh, lots of people still use effectively Google because they Google Hangouts were one of the first systems. Google didn't put much effort into it. They're now trying desperately. I mean, they're trying desperately to catch up with clouds, which they left let uh, Microsoft and Amazon walk away with. Now they're trying to desperately catch up in 
in conferencing where they let uh, um, Teams and Zoom take over. Um, and, and of course, WebEx was all, WebEx is different. WebEx has been here since well before Hangouts existed. Um, here is Slack. Many of us use Slack. I mean, it's, we use Piazza in this class, but Slack is a competitive product. And Slack is plugging away, adding users. Uh, Wall Street doesn't like Slack very much because, because this, um, there's this, you can, you can state, the, take the same data and state it differently. Here we have Statista, which is, you'll see I get, I quite like taking their data. And it says Slack's customer growth accelerates. And then if you go to other, like just look at the general web, you will find negative remarks about Slack because it didn't accelerate as much as Zoom. Zoom really accelerated. And you saw Teams drastically increased, where Slack just kept increasing at a comparable rate to what it was increasing um, uh, before, the, before the pandemic. So, and we know there's lots of potential lawsuits between Slack and Microsoft, because Slack claims that Microsoft is trying to put it out of business by packaging, packaging uh, the equivalent of Slack in, in Microsoft Teams. And Microsoft Teams, the Slack part, the thing equivalent of Slack is meant to be their most popular part. I saw another um, internet news saying that Google was trying to crush Zoom and Slack by um, improving their Google Meet offering. So obviously there's a big battle in this area. And the, the trade-off between capability and uh, reputation and customer knowledge is not quite clear how, who will win. Here is an interesting uh, news item from um, Philips. Philips is a rather traditional um, company, which is uh, well supply makes a good business supply among other ways supplying. Um, technology to the to the government, and uh, they are actually effectively using wearables on uh, in in military applications, if only to just see whether the whether the warriors are actually suffering from um, from uh, some sort of um, medical issue, some, well, including getting COVID. Um, so this is the rapid analysis of threat exposure, where the threat is COVID or possibly biological warfare or something like that. So that's, again, this is the internet of medical things. So this is showing that uh, it's pretty broad. I'm sure we'll, that that area will be hugely growing. Here we come back to telemedicine and there is some sort of, um, debate about the difference in telemedicine and telehealth. And um, this is another one of my, I, there were three failures that the, these slides have highlighted. My other personal failure was telemedicine. We developed, uh, when I was at Syracuse University, a very good telemedicine solution. It actually included my early work on collaborative technologies, the, the Zoom-like capability. And we demonstrated it. I have this photo of me next to Hillary Clinton demonstrating this wonderful solution in 1994. Well, unfortunately, the interest in telemedicine in those days just disappeared. <coughs> so that says that when you want to be to do something important, you have to do that, not only something that's technically interesting and useful, you have to do it at the right time. If you're too late or you're too early, it's no good. You want to do it at exactly the right time. So in my life, I did one thing at the right time. I actually show people how to do parallel computing in a universal fashion. I did that at the right time. Just when the Intel chips, the 8386 and 8087 would support low cost um, microprocessor arrays that they were just becoming available. So that was the perfect timing within six months of the right time. Telemedicine, I was probably off 16 years.
virtual reality while it's still not taking off. So who knows how much I was off, 20 years. And um, conferencing, I was not off so much. I think I, because WebEx was the same time as we were and it survived. We just, probably we were two years off. If we had started two years earlier, we would not have been caught by the year 2000 soft, um, um, in startup crunch, which basically wiped out our ability to keep our best people on, on staff. All right, so do it at the right time. And now is the right time for many things. We're, seeing, we're living in the golden age for startups because the, well, we're in this transitionary phase. We're changing from a, from a probably, we, we, we actually, we did the digital transformation probably broadly over the last few years, but now we're doing the AI transformation. And so the chance of startups in the AI transformation is obviously very high. I hope as part of this course, you identify something that will be great. All right. <clears throat> So here is um, some chart on the on the right, which tells you where telemedicine. Te I meant to mention telehealth and telemedicine are roughly the same thing, with medicine implying that you have a doctor involved at one end of the one end of the system. But I don't think actually that's a huge effect because doctors will always get involved sometime, whether they're directly involved in some instantaneous telemedicine or whether they're indirectly involved because the patient takes their, their internet and medical thing, monitored uh, vitals and shows them to the doctor or the doctor just has gets, you know, has a giant cloud database for all, all his or her patients. And then there's some uh, trigger which says, patient number 203 is uh, suffering from a glucose deficiency. So um, patient number 211 has gone up, the BMI went up factor of two or something, you know. So, you could imagine a doctor uh, having um, access to a, a large amount of automatic monitoring data and then, uh, then just writing triggers, which uh, were told the doctor where they needed to uh, attend to patients. All right, so anyway, telehealth is um, obviously going to be important. And as we noted uh, earlier under COVID, it's going to be increased by COVID because COVID is requiring uh, more tele, telehealth solutions. And they point, and this is, um, has lots of applications, including disease screening, routine care for chronic conditions, checking that people take the right medicines and things like that, and the vital signs are appropriate. There's a pretty interesting report here. I would recommend if you're interested in this area, it's by a company called Doximity for the 2020 State of Telemedicine Report. And they, they seem to be a company which has access to huge amounts of data. And they have a lot of data on the, on the medical visits, uh, which were using telemedicine. And uh, they claim that 20% of all medical visits uh, will, be, will involve telehealth. And um, the amount number of uh, patients that have done telemedicine has um, grown from 14% to 35% just over the last year. And most of them appear to be positive. I mean, at least those with a chronic illness, a chronic illness is not necessary Fatal this just means it's non-trivial. Chronic as used here, I would not use chronic. With a non-trivial illness, um, actually felt it was comparable because it was probably a little, the fact that it's easier to do, they won't have to wait in a waiting room and jump in a car, obviously had, gives it a, a good start. Um, and here we have 67% of patients saying, uh, video and telephone appointments were adequate. But this report is full of data and they break up these numbers into different categories. Uh, now this is sort of um, already we've discussed this under Apple, the Series 6 watch. Um, and um, 
I pointed out that the big tech is dominant in health and medicine. It's a very huge impact because of the people I, I mean, the companies I have here, Apple, which has the dominant watch in the world. Um, there's a company called Veraleaf, which is owned by uh, uh, Google. And um, the uh, Fitbit, which Google is trying to purchase. And uh, these are pictures of uh, Fitbit is on the right, Apple is on the left, and um, we have some, some in, the, in the middle here. And now our final chart in this section here is on, no, no, final, last but one is on remote patient monitoring. So that's just the name, RPM, when that's sort of built into telemedicine. Content worker. Content worker. Just a minute, I have to go offline. I can't take it. I'm in a meeting. Sorry about that. That's the trouble with working from home. People think they can interrupt you. All right, let's move on. Okay, so these are solutions to the COVID problem. Um, these are um, these um, sheets here uh, just come from these. There must be this is a really tiny sample of probably a hundred thousand papers on uh, on various algorithms and machine learning tackling COVID-related problems. Um, and uh, Kegel is a well, you know, you probably all know, probably most of you know Kegel has got a good set of competitions and associated with those competitions are data sets. So there's a COVID data there. Um, there's lots of those data include uh, CT scans and chest x ray images, because we know COVID impacts that. And we all know the John Hopkins University data, which is the universal, the used. Uh, not the only data set because they actually their numbers are not the same as other people's numbers, but they 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 have a very good reputation. They're probably more conservative than some other other charts because I find they give the smallest numbers of most people. And um, anyway, so there's a lot of data sets around. Uh, it's actually COVID is a little better than some fields. I think COVID from the beginning a lot of the data was open. Um, here we have some sort of papers and uh, I, I think the original, there's some links here. You can, you can just find these from Google Scholar. And um, these, I mean, there's obviously machine learning to look at images uh, and to, to identify COVID uh, damage. And uh, especially the lungs are particularly sensitive here. And um, there, there's some, um, here's something on uh, respiratory patterns, which are also trying to identify COVID. Um, here we have uh, <clears throat> some work trying to differentiate flu from COVID. And here was a paper from China, looking at the early Wuhan data. But anyway, this is uh, in a, a tiny sample. Um, all right, here is work I'm more familiar with in that that's a, but it's a smaller area of, of work, but it's using uh, large scale uh, big data and big computing to tackle these issues. And uh, we first make a little important study on drugs. So we know lots of news items about the progress or lack of progress in identifying uh, of either vaccines or drugs to help COVID patients recover, especially with the president's illness that uh, that highlighted many of that. Um, so by that, if we look at drug discovery, this is under underline all that discussion. So it takes a long time to do anything in this field. And part of the reason is that in the past, there have been some well-known examples like the familitide or thalamide, where a drug came out and it had terrible side effects, terrible. 
And so there are a lot of very, very serious uh, checks put into the system to avoid drugs that have side effects because you're injecting the body, you're sorry, not injecting, you're placing in the body chemicals it's not normally expecting to see. And so in principle, there's quite a lot of things that could happen. However, we do have a lot of data and that data is on, maybe are not on the chemical you're interested in, but it may be on related chemicals. And so as we'll see, that can be used to speed up this process. And here we have a little um, chart on the drug discovery process, which it uh, points out it takes many, many years. And um, the uh, cost is, uh, quite high. It ends up being billions of dollars to bring a new drug to market. I think I probably told you, I was once in a meeting in 2010 at the National Institutes of Health, and there were a set of talks from the drug companies, which were all negative. Because in 2010 was sort of the worst point in the drug discovery field, because the new techniques hadn't quite started working very well. And they were taking huge amounts of resources so these, the drug companies saw themselves using lots of resources to make little progress. <coughs> right. Personally, my impression is that's getting better because these new methods are of computational screening are actually making progress. Uh, so here is a nice paper, which actually a student in one of my classes found. I give you the link on, on the left and it has some nice charts about um, as a function of time up to 2015 of the probability of getting through these different steps. And if you look at it, you can just kind of see that 2010, when I actually lost my grant at that stage, because they were so depressed by the situation that they decided that what I was doing was actually wasn't, I don't think what I was doing was particularly successful, but actually the modern AI versions of what I was doing are hugely successful. So they, they gave up too early in this field. Well, obviously they didn't give up because we made this progress. But um, and if we look at these charts, you will see that there's a clear increase in probability as we, as we move forward in time from 2010. It seems to go down from 2003 to 2010 or maybe flat. And now it's starting to improve. Um, but these numbers are not giant, namely the uh, um, overall uh, percentage is not high. And um, that is, and it depends on the field, like oncology is one of the lowest, the green chart in the bottom, bo uh, bottom chart on the, on the right. Um, so I think this data is quite interesting. And you can see you fail at each stage. You have a non-trivial chance of failing at each stage with, a, with, um, so with the overall chance of success being at best 20%. That was probably in um, 2015. Actually, it's 14%. That was the largest chance of success. Uh, here is a slide I actually use in different forms quite often. It's um, a Hong Kong startup called in Silico, and they are using AI to do rapid screening to, uh, to, uh, to run through lots of new molecules to decide which are the most um, useful. And this is a good example of the use of, um, of AI because we have lots of data and those data have Oh, an input are the molecules, with which drugs are just small molecules. And output is the, the, the properties of the, what, the, what those molecules do to people. And that includes not just the positive things they do, but the negative things. Because I told you that the real problem with drugs is not just finding a drug that can help, it's to find a drug that can help but will not destroy the body at the same time. Because like in the case of COVID, we know that uh, a lot of, lot of the problems of COVID are due to the immune system, 
and you want the immune system to be promoted to address the drug, but some of the fatalities in COVID are due to overpromotion of the immune system. So you need to be a little careful that you, because you can have too much of a good thing. Um, and they are they are looking at various form, relatively sophisticated forms of deep learning, like adversarial networks. And this whole area of mapping uh, the the. The, the, the parameters that define a system, whether it be a material or a chemical for drugs, and then mapping it into properties, whether it be the strength of the resultant uh, uh, um, system, if it's used in manufacturing, or the chance of it form having negative side effects if it's a drug. That is a hugely uh, important area where lots of progress has been made just over the last <coughs> year or two. And um, there is not there are many, many papers here. And this, but the, this I highlighted because it actually was an internet announcement in February of last year. I'm outside in February, September of last year. And um, it uh, was striking. It claimed to have um, made huge progress. Here is some results so using software that partly was developed, the projects I was leading, which was um, running large scale simulations on big supercomputers. These are the Department of Energy supercomputers. This work is led by Argonne National Lab uh, with my colleague from Rutgers, who is, is doing a lot of the software. Um, and it is uses many techniques to 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 link machine learning to simulations to get an improved net result. One of these is just replace it. When I told you about uh, using machine learning to predict the answer, well, you can actually do that in um, uh, to uh, the the. The, the machine learning which you use to predict it, it can be trained on computations as well as observations. So you can do computations to decide whether the drug is going to be helpful or not. And then you do that for a thousand drugs and then you predict it, then you extrapolate to the hundred million other possible drugs um, using a machine learning network, which is typically a fully connected network, and like this thing shown at the top left. The next couple of slides, I believe, show uh, sort of some results in use. Um, the one, uh, this is called Deep Drive MD. It's sort of a nice name. Uh, deep Learning Driven um, Molecular Dynamics. MD is Molecular Dynamics. And one important, and the major thing they're doing here is even a slightly different use of deep learning. When you do, you're doing molecular dynamics, so either to find out whether a new drug is any good or to fold proteins or something like that. Well, molecular dynamics takes a long time to simulate and there's lots of degrees of freedom. And um, it's just, and so how, how do you cope with that? Well, you can use machine learning to identify those simulations that are most promising. And so here's some plot against simulation time. And they, after about a 0.01 of a microsecond, they um, examine the, the, where they are in phase space and they just cut out simulations that are not interesting. So they get, an enhanced sample of interesting simulations. And that is done in a sophisticated fashion, which I don't personally fully understand the details, but it's clearly gonna be possible because you can take results of earlier simulations to, to see after say uh, the 0.01 microsecond to see which simulations um, were successful given their state at uh, an, an early times. And you just use that to um, train a neural net. So one advantage of this type of problem, which is simulation trained neural nets, is that um, you have automatic training data because the simulation is specifies the parameters that define the, 
the problem. Uh, well, this is um, sort of a complicated mess, which just points out they have lots of GPUs, lots of molecular dynamic simulations, and lots and lots and lots and lots of GPUs. These are these systems running on large scale DOE machines with tens of thousands of GPUs. They can do um, big, big um, hyperparameter. I mean, if, we, if you know, look at deep learning, the thing that takes most of the time in deep learning for at least many problems is so-called hyperparameter optimization. Because the way you find out the best uh, parameters for your network is you take your network, it depends on the size of the dropout, the number of hidden units at a particular uh, point in the network, and there are lots of points in the network, you can specify that. So you, oh, how do you find out which is best? Well, you just do lots of calculations with different values of those parameters. And that is done routinely in these large GOE machines, because as they have on the whole machine can have, you know, easily have 20,000 GPUs, and maybe your actual, um, actual machine learning might use at most eight GPUs and sometimes just one GPU, you can do quite a lot of hyperparameter optimization in those big systems. That is something we can't do it in university. Most people in universities can't do that. We don't have a big enough system. Here is an interesting comparison of showing the advantage of these guiding the guiding the using machine learning to guide simulations. This effectively the um, the orange is Anton. Anton is the world's best molecular dynamics computer. It's built by the DE Shaw company. DE Shaw actually was a colleague of mine a long, long time ago when he was at Columbia University. I was doing parallel computing service. He, uh, he uh, somehow did better than me. He made a fortune on the stock market using his expertise. And now he is going back and using his stock market uh, gotten funding to do uh, research in various areas, including molecular dynamics. He has my best, one of my best students from that time, John Salmon, working for him. And this orange Anton, which is the world's fastest specialized molecular dynamics machine. And um, you, but at least here you show that the, whereas if I plotted that for the ordinary molecular dynamics run on DOE supercomputers, Anton would look better for these, um, in, for these machines where these simulations where we use machine learning enhancements, uh, we uh, do better with deep drive MD. And that's by doing better means the blue curve is above the orange curve uh, at larger simulation times, because that's what counts in terms of final results. All right, so there's just four different plots. These are a couple of um, examples, uh, two, two examples, um, which I forget what they are, VHP and BBA. You can find that on the papers and uh, with uh, <coughs> different, looking at um, uh, different uh, ways of looking at it. Okay. So this is the last few set of slides. We can probably go through these. Um, all right, so this is just a list of areas where you, in COVID, where you can do at least computational studies. So uh, a lot of people, and not me particularly, but a lot of people do COVID tissue simulations. Uh, Paul Macklin and James Glazer groups do those. You model the cells, you model the tissue. <coughs> you model the virus in its motion and you model their interaction. Um, there's a lot of work. Um, I have some colleagues at the University of Virginia, which I've worked with for a long time in epidemiology, computational epidemiology, which is sometimes, which is related to the general problem of so-called critical infrastructure. Critical infrastructure is these large network systems of which the biggest networking is of people, but there's also roads, water, and so on, transportation. And um, th this whole area of understanding the spread of COVID by contact, where you have to have models for social distancing and things is quite, so, I mean, they used, uh, or I think they're still using 
a full supercomputer, half a supercomputer fully used per day to, to do these modeling. Then of course we have these, I, I went through lots of wearables. So there's devices, you have to design the device and then write the software to analyze its results. Then there's lots of in general of diagnostic data. Do you write the software to analyze that diagnostic? And then the recently we've been looking at possible drugs, which is a, called the field of chemioinformatics. And um, you can either use the computer to do that or you can do real work from real testing. And then the whole medical system has infrastructure and which then includes, if you like, telehealth. So these are all interesting areas. Um, so I wanted to make a few general remarks here in the final few minutes about complex systems. So for a long time, I've worked on complex systems. So what are complex systems? So there are sets of entities which um, are defined by some graph probably about how they're connected. People are connected by talking to each other and traveling to each other and things like that, or jumping and they're connected to cars by when they get transportation. So you have a set of connected entities, uh, which in the case of physics, uh, these are quarks or galaxies. And those have real equations. Complex systems tend not to have real equations. And pandemics are complex systems, but most systems in the world are complex systems by this definition, because they don't have fundamental equations, but they do have entities which interact. And actually modern machine learning is a particularly attractive for complex systems because modern machine learning is looking for hidden variables. Well, that sounds good because we don't actually know what the variables are because these complex systems are precisely the systems where we don't know what's going on. And um, a good example of some things which I, you can read about in the, in the notes on uh, transportation systems is the works on uh, transport, which is the work by Didi and Uber, <coughs> where they're taking the system of cars and people and roads and trying to, and using, um, using deep learning to predict uh, where to put the drivers to pick up the, the riders and so on. The area which has probably historically got the most work in this area is called war games, where you're doing military simulations of possible conflicts. <coughs> and they have to develop something called event-driven simulations, which are an old fashioned way of looking at this. But I think deep learning is much more likely to succeed. Um, and so that's what it says here, that it's um, deep learning is particularly attractive for this type of complex system as it um, is learns hidden variables. And I have this theory that actually, if the com, <coughs> sorry, I've been speaking too long. <coughs> the complex system is actually, is there are equations but we don't know them or there are guiding forces but we don't know what they are then we can expect deep learning to work the one area where we might not work are earthquakes because an earthquake might be totally random there's some reason to believe they're largely random whereas i don't think uh, covid has some randomness i mean that if you pass an infection from a to b there's some probability that B is infected. But still, <coughs> it's not totally random, but there's some systematics. It's just that not every interaction leads to an infection. Here's some work that, uh, in the, this is, here, this is, so here, here's some work where we're trying to understand the John Hopkins data. This is done by, with Gregor, who's on the, on the class. And this takes the, um, COVID data from 314 cities and uh, tries to uh, produce a deep learning model using long short term um, uh, models, um, LSTMs, and it gives pretty reasonable answers. And, uh, I'm, and uh, that's those for the total data here is for New York City. And you can see it's actually, you can, learn these results quite well. Um, 
So, as well as these purely deep learning based, you can actually build models. That's what Glacier and um, Macklin are doing here. And you can model the spread of the disease inside the um, uh, human body, just as you can actually also do real deterministic simulations, computational epidemiology, which puts in models with social distancing. So you either look at the data, which is what I showed you in those results with Gregor, and learn the social distancing effectively from the data, or you feed it into a model and try to do the same type of prediction. And then you can actually not only predict um, the people getting ill, you can even look at the chemicals, the viruses, the people using, how people move, how what policies are made, where to put beds, where to put ventilators, and the value of particular diagnostic infrastructure. So all of this could be studied from pandemics as a complex system. And I expect this area to be uh, more and more promising because uh, we're gonna get more and more complex systems where we need to be able to make progress. All right, so that's the last slide, I believe. Yes, so let's go off the air and see if there are any um, Any questions? Uh, Gregor, are there any questions in the chat that I need to answer? I don't see any one new message. All right, so, all right, so uh, do people have any questions? I don't see anything I need to answer in the chat. All right, so the homework will be uh, making the next final step towards defining your project. And then you'll be working on your project for most of the remainder of the class, which is about the last month. Okay, thank you very much. I will put this Zoom on, uh, Zoom on the, on the uh, on, on the web when it's uh, being processed through, through the into an MP4. Thank you very much.